Hello, boils and ghouls. Did I say boys and ghouls? Boils and ghouls. So, we just talked about a decent amount of stuff here with the Mothman in episode one. We talked about the legend of Chief Cornstalk and the curse that he supposedly put on the land around Point Pleasant, West Virginia. We talked about the whole Sandhill Crane theory, the mutation theory that maybe it was a mutated crane or some type of bird. Talked about how the, the TNT area is so just fucked with chemicals and everything in the ground and that possibly it could be a hallucinogenic reaction that people were having and they were actually seeing something maybe a crane and unknowingly they were being affected by these chemicals and bam mothman but we got a lot to dive into here especially when we get into the real out there stuff with the UFO sightings and the strange lights in the sky and injured cold. That's what we're talking about this episode. Now, during the late 60s, 66, leading into 67, up to the bridge collapse, the Silver Bridge, there were there's just as many Mothman sightings and reports. There were just as many, if not more, reports of seeing orbs in the sky, unusual aircrafts, uh, lights performing maneuvers that defied all types of conventional explanation. Some accounts even mention encounters with humanoid figures associated with these UFOs. Now, the most notable UFO sighting in Point Pleasant took place on November 2nd, 1966, when we had two couples reported encountering a large gray creature near the TNT area, which I mentioned in the first video was a World War II munition storage area right outside of Point Pleasant, outside the town. And this is the hot spot for the Mothman sightings. It's also a hot spot for UFO sightings. So this couple was down there and following their encounter they claimed to observed a large glowing object in the sky that hovered and darted around before disappearing. And this incident is referred to as the Mothman UFO incident. This is what tied the Mothman sightings to the UFO activity and just added so much more mystery to this already strange phenomenon going on. This is also where theorists started putting together the idea that this Mothman creature could be either extraterrestrial in origin or it could be an interdimensional being as we mentioned and talked about in the last video and the UFO sightings were a part of its presence or its associated phenomenon. Others suggest that the sightings of both the Mothman and the UFOs were a result of psychological factors, mass hysteria, or a combination of misidentifications and hoaxes. We went into the whole misidentification thing with the crane. You know how I feel about that stupidity. Even with the mutation theory that can hold some ground, I still don't buy it. So... We have UFO sightings and strange orbs and lights in the sky being reported and being sighted just as much, if not more, than the Mothman itself. This is what brings us to the infamous Indrid Cold. Now, who is Indrid Cold? Indrid Cold is a supposed humanoid figure that is supposedly supposed to be an extraterrestrial of some kind that was often mentioned in connection with the sightings and the encounters in Point Pleasant the UFOs, the Mothman sightings and he was referred to sometimes as the Grinning Man due to his unusual facial expression which was just a grin and he was according to some eyewitnesses who met Indrid Cold he spoke telepathically to them. So he had this grinning face on, no change in his facial expression, but he would relay the information of what he's saying to these people telepathically. Now for when Indrid Cold 
first came into the whole Mothman story. He was believed to have made contact with, witness, with several witnesses in Point Pleasant during the same time period as the Mothman sightings in the late 60s. So some individuals reported encountering cold separately from their Mothman sightings, while others claim to have seen both of them at the same time, Injured Cold and the Mothman together. So witnesses who encountered Injured Cold described him as a tall and thin, with a strange appearance and an unsettling, constant grin. He's known for his ability to communicate telepathically and through odd buzzing sounds. Injured Cold would often ask questions about the witnesses' personal lives or deliver cryptic messages. His interactions were generally perceived as eerie and left people feeling unsettled and even frightened. You goddamn right frightened. Are you serious? Some grinning dude talking to me telepathically and I'm not going to be frightened? Now, there's a lot of theories on what exactly Indrid Cold was or is and the connection between him and the Mothman. Some people think that Cold and the Mothman were separate entities, that Indrid Cold was kind of an observer or a communicator for an unknown group of extraterrestrials. Other people think that Cold was a kind of manifestation of the Mothman itself kind of taking on a different form to interact with witnesses. That is kind of stupid. I, I mean, as like I said, as much as I want to believe in all of this and aliens and all that type of stuff, the Mothman itself, as a creature, say it does exist, why would it take on a, a, a human form just to, to talk to witnesses that witnessed him? I, that's a little far-fetched. It's like a way far fetch. The whole story of Injured Cold originated with a man named Woodrow Derenberger. Now, what's interesting about this is how I just mentioned with the UFO sightings that the major UFO event, that's like the, the Mothman UFO incident, took place on November 2nd of 1966. This takes place on the same date, November 2nd, 1966. We had Woodrow Derenberger, who was driving home from work in Parksburg, West Virginia, and he claimed to have been approached by a vehicle that he described as metallic and like an olive-shaped object, a UFO. So the vehicle reportedly was hovering above the ground and emitted a strange noise before it came to a full stop. So according to Darren Berger's account, a man stepped out of the vehicle and approached him. The man introduced himself as Indrid Cold and communicated with Darren Berger telepathically. Cold allegedly had a peculiar appearance, again with a broad grin, high-pitched voice, and an overall unsettling demeanor. Darren Berger, of course, freaking the hell out, I'm sure, at this point, reported that Indrid Cold asked him various questions about life on Earth, shared information about his home planet, and made cryptic statements about the future. This encounter with Cold and the subsequent interviews that Darren Berger gave about this experience gained pretty big attention and helped popularizing the figure of Indrid Cold in the Mothman lore and just... He's known, Indrid Cold, that name is known now just in UFO circles and alien circles and, you know, people who look into all that. It's worth noting, though, that while Darren Berger's account is the first widely known report of meeting Indrid Cold, there have been other similar encounters from individuals claiming to have encounters with the same or similar entities, alleged extraterrestrials that speak telepathically. We've heard this so many times when talking about UFOs and alien abductions and everything. They talk telepathically, that they don't have to communicate the way that we do. We've heard this many, many times, and this is just another thing that just links into all of this huge urban legend here of the Mothman now. So we have these UFO sightings. We have orbs in the sky. We have on the same night as the biggest UFO sighting in Point and around Point Pleasant is the same night that Indrid Cold shows up to Derenberger. 
that's a little coincidental. And these are two reports coming from two separate parties. You know, the people who were involved with the UFO incident and Derenberger. Very coincidental, I think that's very interesting that it's on the exact same date. That on that date, while they were seeing lights in the sky and saw a craft, Derenberger also saw a craft and was visited by cold. Very interesting. Now, just like the Mothman has been theorized as being extraterrestrial in origin or interdimensional same theories have been applied to injured cold again the sighting that Derenberger claims seeing the UFO seeing the craft hovering there would make you think that it's an extraterrestrial but just like Mothman could possibly be an interdimensional being we hear this with extraterrestrials all the time. Maybe they're from another dimension and we just can't see them. Now, let's put injured cold on ice for a little bit and go back and talk some more reported sightings here. Now, early on, in the very beginning of the sightings, a woman gave a statement saying that she remembers that it was not referred to as Mothman in the beginning. It was referred to as Birdman several, several times. Forget what I was talking about because I just made a call to the Mothman Museum <laughs> and left a message with the woman there of trying to get Jeff Wombly, who runs the museum, for an interview. So if that happens, I'll insert it into the final episode or so of this uh, series. Now comes in another theory but this one is a lot more deeply rooted in legend and specifically Native American legend now the Thunderbird it was a Native American and you see this in so many Native American tribes and ancient Aztecs and pretty much every civilization has had the myth of a giant Firebird, her giant bird creature that would fly across the sky. Just like with the UFOs, just like with Indrid Cold, there has been a lot of theorizing whether there's a connection between the Native American myths of the Thunderbird and the sightings of the Mothman. It can make sense, sure, they're they're big winged creatures. But when's the last time you saw a fuck Thunderbird? When's the last time you saw one? I'll wait. Never. So, again, this is just like the... For me, this is like the Chief Cornstalk stuff. Except not real at all. <laughs> he actually existed. The Thunderbird stuff, it's just more Native American lore. That's all it is. You, it's fun to theorize. It's fun to throw in. Maybe the Mothman is is related to all the old myths, ancient myths of Thunderbirds. But again, this is just fun speculation. There's nothing here to go off of to try to actually figure out what the Mothman was or is and what these people were seeing. Even more theorizing and stories tied to this legend is that there were supposedly a lot of satanic rituals and stuff allegedly that would go down in the TNT area so not only does the TNT area outside of Point Pleasant have the Mothman tied to it does it have these UFO sightings and the lights in the sky but it also has of reputation for again supposed and alleged satanic uh, gatherings and rituals that would be taking place there there definitely was some weird stuff going on in the TNT area which just leads to more theories on did one of these cults or religious nutbags <laughs> open up some type of portal to another dimension or 
unleash some type of curse upon the land. The same with like the Chief Cornstalk curse. There's, like I said, there's just layers and layers and layers to all of this. That it's it's just a rabbit hole you can go down. We're going down it together. Now, a few more sightings, and these are just a very, very few. And these are some of the more initial ones following Scarberry and uh, the Mallets, their drive back into Point Pleasant where they were chased by this supposed Mothman. There was an incident, and it's, I think it's interesting too, that these are all within days of each other. That happened on the 15th of uh, November with uh, Scarberry and Mallet. The next day, on the 16th, Thomas Urey, who was a contractor, reported seeing a large bird-like creature in the TNT area. He described it as having huge red eyes and a 10-foot wingspan. So this is a day after the initial sighting. Then on the 24th of, of November 1966, Marcella Bennett, a resident of Point Pleasant, reported encountering the Mothman near her home. She described it as a large gray creature with wings and large red eyes. The next day, November 25th, Connie Carpenter reported seeing the same creature while visiting her father's home in Point Pleasant. She claimed to have seen a large bird-like creature with glowing red eyes. This last one is the day of the collapse of the Silver Bridge, which connected Point Pleasant to Ohio and resulted in the deaths of 46 people. Some witnesses reported seeing the Mothman in the area before the bridge collapsed, leading to speculation of a connection between the two events, which we talked about in the last video. Now, another interesting thing with this case is after the collapse of the Silver Bridge on the 15th of December in 67, a lot of, pretty much most of the reports of Mothman stopped for a little bit. There were still here and there reports. Same with the UFOs and everything, but it all kind of slowed down. Now, you can look at this as... Two different things. The more logical side would make you think that people were seeing something, like we established, they weren't seeing any, they weren't seeing nothing, but they were seeing something. So let's go with the Sandhill Crane theory, just to go with it. You have this small town. In a matter of a few days you're getting reports coming in of seeing this large bird-like creature in the TNT area. Then, a year later, almost to the day, you have the bridge collapse after a year of a bunch of reports and sightings of the Mothman. Then you have this huge tragedy happening in this small town where 46 are killed in this bridge collapse. And then nothing on the Mothman for a little bit. It's almost as if people stopped paying attention to it because something much more severe and tragic was happening. Something more realistic was happening. Reality happened. And hence, the story stopped for a little bit. I don't know. I, I, I want to lean that way. The skeptic in me does. But, again, there's so much more to this whole case than just the Mothman that I can't make a decision just on that. Or, you can look at the other side of it. That, after the bridge collapse, the reason that he wasn't reported being seen for a little while after this is because he was some type of omen, as we mentioned in the last video. A good omen, a bad omen, whichever. He was there for the bridge collapse. The bridge collapsed, hence he gone. Makes sense, too. Now, in a lot of the documentaries I've seen on the Mothman and everything to do with Point Pleasant, they kind of mention this 
every single time what I was just talking about that in 66 67 with the height of the sightings after the bridge collapsed it slowed down considerably but there were still sightings pretty consistently through the 70s 80s 90s and then it kind of ramped up and we started getting more and more frequent sightings but in 1985 there were mysteriously large feathers that were found in an igloo in the TNT area so nobody ever found out to my knowledge where those feathers came from I mean if you, you would think if this creature is living in the TNT area you'd be finding feathers all over the place but again who knows what this was again was it a crane was it the the feathers of a sandhill crane that was just living in the TNT area that's a possibility to explain the feathers then we have an interesting report from a woman named Leah Wilson in August of 1987 that she heard a noise outside of her house so she was at her family farmhouse it was around 2 in the morning she was just watching movies and she was getting ready to go to bed and she hears a screeching sound from outside and the only way that she could describe it after process of elimination she thought maybe it was an owl at first and said there's no way that this is an owl she said the only way she can describe it is like from the movies like the pterodactyls shrieks that's how she's able to describe it that it was so loud and piercing that she had to get up and look outside and see if she could see what this was so she goes to the window and she opens the the blinds and she sees the mothman creature there the wingspan is so big it's covering the window like it's blocking out she can't see past this thing that's how big it is and that's how big the wingspan was now she says when it went on top of the house because after she went out and looked out the window and saw this creature it and she could hear the whoosh like it was so loud that she can hear it going from in front of the house to the top of the house now there was another account from 87 from a young girl in high school she was in school in in 87 her and her boyfriend were going up to Quincy Hill which is outside of Point Pleasant or a nearby town and they saw a creature that she described was like six feet tall and it looked like an insect like his knees went were bent backwards and it made it walk in a very unnatural way and this has been described by several eyewitnesses as the way that it walks that it walks in a very unnatural way almost like a bird and a common thing that's been reported with a lot of these eyewitness sightings is the way that the Mothman walks in sightings that were not him flying around and shit that he has this weird shuffling gait to it that it's not used to walking on its legs and this has been reported several other times with Mothman sightings so as we can see the strangeness is piling up the mysteries and the questions are piling up and there is so much more next episode we'll dive into the men in black making their appearance in point pleasant more on mary hire the journalist who was chronicling and uh keeping account of all these people who were calling in with their experiences and that everything that they've seen and see if we can uh figure out any more theories on what this could possibly be the identity of the mothman of point pleasant 
see you next time, guys.